Hello and welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. I'm your host, Gabe Peterson, and this is the place investors go to gain actionable advice, learn about current market trends, and hear war stories from other professional investors out there in the field today. Before we get started, I have two quick housekeeping items for you. First, if you like this episode, we would very much appreciate a like, subscribe, and share. It is the best way to support the show and keep it running far into the future. Second, if you're a new investor looking to get started in real estate or an experienced investor looking to take your investing to the next level, I've created an ebook just for you that will cover how to find deals that are actually deals, how to finance those deals with little to no money down, and how to exit those deals for maximum value. On top of that, I throw in an insane amount of free bonuses that you'll have access to once you buy the ebook. All I charge is our admin costs to keep this show running. So if you're serious about real estate investing and want to create both active and passive income as an investor, head on over to the website at therealestateinvestingclub.com and click on the button that says, get the ebook in the upper right-hand corner to grab yourself a copy. With that said, let's dive right in. Today, we have a very special guest with us ready to drop some investor knowledge on you. So buckle up, grab your pen and paper and enjoy the ride. All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. Today we have Ken Gee with us. Ken is the founder and managing partner of KRI Partners and the KRI Group of Companies. He has more than 24 years of real estate, banking, private equity, and uh, principal investing experience. So Ken brings a lot of wisdom to us today, which is why I am super excited to have you on, Ken. Thank you for showing up. Well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, there you go. And uh, and small little fun fact, my dad's name is actually Ken. So uh, it's a good name. Is it really? Oh, name. awesome. Yep. <laughs> good name. Smart man. <laughs> um, I, uh, I told you before we jumped on here at the Real Estate Investing Club, we always start with stories. I like to hear, you know, kind of how you got started and, and how you got down this path. So why don't you take us to the beginning? How'd you, uh, how'd you get started in real estate in the first place? Yeah, good, good question. So uh, as it turns out, my history includes uh, five years as a commercial lender. Uh, when I was uh, a lender, all I kept hearing uh, or all I kept seeing my customers do was make a lot of money in real estate, right? <laughs> and they also said, hey, you know what? Before I do this, before I do that, I want to talk to my accountant. I thought, all right, well, that sucks. I, I want you to confide in me. So I went and I became an accountant and went to work for Deloitte for seven years, where the, the, the Cleveland office at the time of Deloitte had a huge real estate practice. So here I again had our clients making tons of money in real estate. And uh, I wasn't in there yet. So I said, you know what, enough of this. So I spent about a year and a half trying to figure it out, going to apartment associated meetings and, and things like that. And uh, in 1997, bought my first deal, 28 units, a uh, small part of Cleveland called Shaker Square. And uh, over the next several years, uh, you know, added units throughout Cleveland, about 10 or 15 years ago, we made the switch to Florida because I thought, my gosh, if I could do well in Cleveland, what if I actually was in a growth market? So about 15 years ago, we went to start figuring out the, the Florida market, and that's where we are now, exclusively in central and northern Florida. Nice. I love it. So you were, uh, were kind of on the sidelines, like you were you know, a CPA, you were working with people who were in real estate, yes. um, and you're just like, hell no, I want to do that, so let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much you know about CPAs, but they work really, really hard, and uh, it's kind of it's disappointing to see your clients just making money hand over fist in real estate, and you're helping them. Yeah. But I mean, with that said, we love our CPAs. I, uh, I, I couldn't live without mine. So, um, so absolutely a lot of love goes out to them too. So 1997 you jumped out of the sidelines. You decided it's time to jump in. I want to be a real estate investor myself. You started with multifamily. What was the reason, um, reasoning behind that? Did you just, you know, is the, the most prevalent thing or, or why'd you decide to go down multifamily? Yeah, good question. So, uh, you know, like most people, they start off thinking, okay, do I want to buy a single family house? Or do I want to buy a duplex? If you think about the situation I was in then, I was working at Deloitte. So I was making, you know, I was working a lot, 70, 80 hours a week. So I couldn't, I couldn't, and, and I had a new, uh, a, a new child. So there was just no way in my life. Which is another 70, go, 80 hours a week right there. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but there was no way I could actually do the work myself. So I said, all right, I have to buy something big enough that I can kind of treat as a mm. business. Uh, 
Yep. So 28 units said, wait a minute, this makes sense. I can have someone on site, give her a free apartment. She can do a lot of the work for me. I can hire maintenance guys. So the 28 units gave me enough income to do that. That's how I ended up with multifamily. And I, you know, I always liked apartments. I mean, a lot of the clients that I talked to owned apartments and they did it because, I mean, they're apartments. Everybody needs a place to live. And it seemed just logical that that'd be a good place to, uh, to invest. So that's kind of how I got there. Perfect. And I love that you said, uh, treat it as a business because that is a mistake that I made. And I feel like a mistake many others make is yeah. they want to get in real estate and they're thinking, you know, I don't have a lot of money, so I'm going to start small and that's, you know, I'm going to get my foot in the door, maybe buy one unit, maybe another, a uh, couple months down the road, a couple years down the road. And while that does make sense, uh, it, in practice, it is kind of shooting yourself in the foot because I, <laughs> you know, like you said, when you buy a bigger unit, you can actually hire people to help you. And that is, man, that is good. So it's really cool that you, you kind of had that, that wisdom at the very beginning. You said, I'm not going to buy something small that I have to ma manage myself. I'm going to buy right. something big um, where I can actually hire the help uh, yep. that I need in order to run it. So um, kudos you to it. you for having that, that foresight there. Um, so you got in the multifamily, started in Cleveland, and then you moved down to Florida. Um, Take me through that process. You know, people, a lot of people want to invest outside of their own market. I mean, I, yeah. I live in Seattle and Seattle is just crazy. It's like, everything's a it free is. cap here. Yep. Um, so I, you know, I looked outside, I went to, to Texas to buy self-storage. So what was your uh, kind of thought process there in, you know, out of state investing? And did you move there first or did you, did you begin to buy um, when you weren't located in Florida? Yeah. So uh, interesting. I don't live in Florida. I currently still live in Cleveland. I just spend more than half my time in Florida because that's where every, I mean, we're all throughout central and Northern Florida. Uh, we take care of a, almost a couple thousand units. So we're really oh, wow. busy. So I, you know, there's not, believe it or not, I first thought of Florida because, well, why not go do what you like to do in an area that you'd like to be in, right? I mean, Florida is a great place to be. Just, just to be there. It's wonderful weather, you know, all the reasons you want to be in Florida. Um, now, from a financial standpoint, it made sense because I know it's a growing market and I'm coming from Cleveland. So Cleveland is not a growing market. And it's, I mean, you can make money in, in Cleveland, but you have to do it differently. It's hard. You know, when we renovate a property in Florida, we get 300 bucks, 400 bucks increase in rents. There's no way on earth I could do that in Cleveland. I was hoping for 50 bucks in Cleveland. So about 10 or 15 years ago, it, you know, I always tell my kids the story. I, I decided, all right, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to go figure this out. Well, when you get off the plane, there's no one there to meet you. This mm. is the interesting part, the part that people don't think about when you're trying to go out of your market. So you've got to figure out, okay, where do I want to start? I got to start understanding markets. I have to somehow create some credibility with brokers so that they'll actually take me seriously because in markets like Florida, they have way more buyers than they need. They don't really need another buyer to, to spend time with. So that whole process took quite a bit of time because you, you just had to slowly just go tour properties and talk to brokers. We already knew what we were doing. We just didn't know the Florida market. So that it just, it was a very long, slow process that we went through because I'm, you know, I, feel pretty strongly that if I'm going to ask you to invest your money with me, I need to know what I'm doing. I need to understand the market really thoroughly and know exactly how we're going to make money in that market. So it took us a while, but it's that on the ground stuff. And probably the hardest thing in that growth market is building the credibility that you're a legitimate buyer and it takes time. Yep. Man, I love that. I actually, I made that mistake. Well, you know, everything's, everything's a mistake until you get through it and then that's right. fine. But um, I bought in Texas without, you know, establishing a presence there. Um, and I, looking back, I'm realizing that is so important going down there, talking to people, um, understanding the markets well. Um, so it sounds like that's what you did. You got some, you got, you met with brokers, you, you showed them that you're actually a, a legitimate buyer who should be taken seriously. And, and then you, you pulled the trigger. That's awesome. And I like, so it sounds like economics is a big thing. Obviously you want to buy in a growth market. You don't want to buy in a shrinking market. Um, but then I like that you said you, you wanted to buy in a place that you actually wanted to visit. Um, that is, that's key to me because I've, I've been thinking about that. Um, I really like South Carolina. I love Charleston. And so I've been thinking about making that kind of a focus um, mm -hmm. just because I like the area. You know, I would like to go there. And so uh, it sounds like that's, you had the same mindset there. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with trying to set your life up so that you can be where you want to be. Yep. I mean, that Absolutely. is why we work, right? Yep. We work to serve our life, right? And you know, you're in Cleveland, I'm in Seattle. We don't get any sun here, so we got to pick something that has a little bit more sun. <laughs> we don't get much sun here either. <laughs> um awesome so florida multifamily it's great that you guys saw so much success um that's not all you do though you do i mean i, I listed it off in the beginning you do many different things so and one of them being um you kind of focus on private equity and raising capital so kind of take us to that that's uh it's something that i'm kind of going through myself i told you this you know before we hop on the show um, i'm starting to look into raising outside capital so what are the first few steps that someone um, should consider when they, you know, want to take down a, a $3 million, $5 million deal that is not, you know, they don't have the capital for? Sure. So you got to do, in my opinion, a number of things all at the same time. The first is you want to actually make sure you know what you're doing because you're going to look an investor in the eye and you want to be, you, you want to be genuine, right? You want to, you want to know what you're doing. You want to understand the business that you're asking them to invest in so that you can be successful. That's probably the first thing. In addition to that, this, you need to line up a team that is going to, is going to help you. For example, a securities attorney. I mean, they're, they're extremely important. There, there are rules about how you do this, what sort of exemptions are available, what rules you have to follow because the SEC sets all these rules. And the last thing I want is the SEC, you know, knocking on my door because I didn't do something right. So you need to get your hands around what kind of an offering you want to do and what are the rules and so on and so forth. So you can do a lot of that research on the Internet, but you do definitely need a securities uh, attorney. And um, after that, it's it's the, the whole networking thing, right? It depends on what type of offering you're going to do whether it's going to be a 506B or a 506C, meaning it's only accredited investors or you'll let other people in, it's going to dictate how you market or not market uh, your offering. You know, is it going to just be friends and family? You know, that's kind of how I started out, friends and family. And then we kind of grew out from there after we had established a track record. Then, you know, your, your, your natural circle of influence starts to grow because people see that you're successful then they come to you, hey, I'd like to do that too. And then you let a few more people in and they tell a few more people. And then at some point, you know, like we are now, we just did, uh, we switched from the syndication model to the blind pool fund model. And that's a completely different model where people, so in syndication means you go find the deal, you um, lock it down, negotiate it, and then you go raise the money to get the deal done. In the blind pool fund model, it's the opposite. So you go out and raise the money first and investors invest in the concept that you're going to buy this type of asset and this type of area. And this is the kind of returns you're going to go for. And then they make commitments to the fund. And then you go and do what you told them you were going to do and then call that capital as you find the deals to fill, fill the fund. So that's, we just finished a $13 million raise. We're about to start on a $50 million raise. Uh, on our next fund after we finish deploying this one. But that's the sort of the natural progression um, of, you know, sort of beginner to probably the blind pool fund is probably the more advanced type of raise that you do. But by this time, you know, we're way beyond our normal circle of friends that we raise money from, you know, it's, it, we're talking, you know, well over a hundred investors and in all of our funds and things like that. So uh, that's sort of the story from beginning to end, but it starts, it all starts out with just understanding the landscape and what you're trying to do. And then make sure that you actually know how to do what it is you're going to go do. Like if it's apartments or self storage or whatever it is, make sure you've got it. Make sure you've had some success under your belt because the investors are probably going to want to see some of that. Yep. Yep. So if I got um, the progression, right. So you're saying, you know, you start out, everybody's going to start out with kind of their own money um, or maybe, you know, a relative's money, something like that. Yep. They found that small deal, they do it, they, they prove their success. The next step after that is raising just strictly from friends, family, people you know in your circle. And then you go on to syndications, which is, that's a 506B, correct? Well, syndications can be B or C. It, okay. What matters is what types of investors you have. Um, so a 506C allows you to market. So I can market to anybody I want to, but I can only let accredited investors in. 506B 
says, time out, you, you are not allowed to market to, to the open public. You can only show your deal to people that you've already established a relationship with. And there's mm -hmm. some other rules, right? I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the rules, yeah. but it doesn't matter whether it's a syndication or a fund, you still are potentially fill it, fit into one of those two um, exemptions. And, and remember, the, the scenario that you're laying out is just one way to do it. There are lots of different ways to get into this. A lot of people will start off as passive investors with guys like us, kind of see what we're doing, kind of understand it, you know, do some training on the side. And then when they feel like they're, they're good enough, then they'll go out and start doing it on their own. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but most people do it the way you just described. Makes sense. And then, so after syndication, the blind pool fund model, that's uh, that makes a lot more sense. And I feel like from an operating standpoint, it would be a lot easier. Question that came into my mind is, um, so you said you did a $13 million raise. Does that $13 million, does it need, is that dedicated just to one deal or is it just a, a blanket 13 that you can apply to however many deals that you're able to, to acquire right. with it? Yeah. The idea here, the fund size is geared to get two or three deals in the fund. Um, and so I, one thing I just, I do want to say is a lot of people never go to the blind pool fund mm. um, business model. They stick with syndications. They're very good at it. They like it. You know, they've built up their pool of investors. And, and so many people never leave the syndication model. I just want to make sure that's clear. Mm -hmm. The blind pool fund model, we did it out of necessity. We're operating in a very, very competitive market, which is central and northern Florida. So we went to that model because we want we need to differ differentiate ourselves as buyers. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the market syndicators, they have to go raise the money. Well, Mr. Seller, Mr. Broker, I've already raised the money. Mm -hmm. so that yeah. whole deal is off the table. So you come in as a stronger buyer. So we use that model as a way to differentiate ourselves. And it's proven very effective uh, to, to help us get deals, right? We're not, you're not going to steal anything in Florida, especially now, but it at least gives you a, a leg up on any other buyer that's bidding on that same property. Yep. No, that makes uh, that makes complete sense. So, I mean, going to a seller and you're saying, hey, I, I have, still have to raise the money for this or... I already have the money. We're ready to go. Obviously, they're going to choose the person who, who's ready to go. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, Most of the time, yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you for taking us through that. Uh, what's next for you guys? What's the, what's the next big, um, you know, big step for you? Yeah, the next step is to just continue to uh, you know, expand our investor base, continue to expand our operations slowly. I'm a pretty conservative person. So I want to be, you know, I want to have very deliberate, controlled growth. Because, you know, companies that fail, you know, many of them fail because they just focused on growth, 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 and they didn't build out the foundation below that to support it. So we vertically integrate, meaning we manage our own stuff. That's important to oh, me cool. that we have that framework and that whole foundation in place. So the next logical step for us is a, just a larger fund, a $50 million fund that will go after larger deals. And, that, and that's kind of typical uh, of the life cycle of somebody that does what we do. Nice. I love it. I'm actually at that step where, uh, you know, I'm, they're not quite, I'm not quite big enough where I can hire, you know, bring everything in house, but man, I would love to, because then it would just be, you know, you'd have a little bit more oversight into everything right now. I have property managers, you know, third party property managers managing things, but it'd be great to, uh, to have that, that all in house, but, um, you know, we all go in steps. So you're, you're, I don't know how many miles ahead of me. So, which is great to see. You'll get there. You'll yep. get there. And, and just realize, you know, property management is a double-edged sword, right? I mean, we, we do it because I'm a very detail-oriented person. I, you know, we've been doing this for 23, 24 years, and we've made a lot of the mistakes that we don't have to, we don't want to wait for a third-party manager to learn again, right? We've already done it. Yep. And I believe a good part of the success of our funds and our investments is on the execution of our business plan. So it puts me in really tight control of all of that stuff. And that that's important to me. But again, there's nothing wrong with using third-party managers. Uh, just manage them. That's all. And, uh, you know, make sure you're per they're performing and, and you'll be fine with them. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. I just took a peek at the clock. Uh, it looks like we have blown through the time that we get a chat because we need to jump into the quick question round. Are you ready? I am. All right. Um, it starts with books uh, or pretty much any form of education. I used to say books only, but now people, you know, they consume media in many different ways. So if you could choose two forms of media, two things, um, book, movie, YouTube channel, whatever, uh, that you could recommend one for general life wisdom and then one for real estate specific. 
Yeah, real estate specific. Um, I, there are so many um, seminars, masterminds, um, different people like that. Get around those people that have experience in this business because you're going to solve two problems. One is the information you're going to learn. But the other thing you're going to do is develop networks. You're going to learn from other people. And I think that's important. And in terms of just general life, I mean, I've been I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid fifties now. So, you know, even back when I was in my twenties, I was all about the, you know, Stephen Covey and all of the, all of the self-help, the development, you know, I try to learn as much as I can. When I was in school, I thought, man, I can't get wait to get out of school. I hate it. I hate it. Right. Well, as soon as I got out of school, I'm like, wait a minute. Now I really want to learn. Now I got to go back. And that's when I really got started. So uh, in terms of forms, I tend to like uh, just online blogs. And, mm -hmm. and I, I learned so much online uh, from some very good uh, sources that I would encourage people to start there. Perfect. Do you got one in mind that you would, uh, you would recommend or is just, uh, you know, Google, Google, you know, um, I mean, you can look at anything Tony Robbins has written, Grant Cardone's written. I mean, there's so many of those guys. Um, what I try to do is, is, is learn from people who are where I want to go. That's what I've always tried to do. I've always tried to go up a level and figure out what are they doing that I'm not? What can, what can I learn from them? Um, I love reading everything that Warren Buffett writes. Uh, you know, it's not just about real estate. It's about general life because the reality of it is this is just a business. Most of the thing that slows people down is their own mind, right? You got to get your mind right. You got you to you teach your mind how to become somebody different than you are today. And that's hard. That's really hard. So that's why this... It's not just about real estate, at least in my opinion. Yep. No, I couldn't agree more. Real estate is just, uh, it's kind of the expression of everything that you, that you yeah. are, that you do. So I love it. Uh, moving on, uh, United States, it is a very large place. I don't know how many square miles. I say that every time. I got to figure out how many square miles there actually are in the U.S. So I could, I could quote some, uh, some facts here. But anyways, it's a big place. There's a lot of places to invest. So what is one place besides your backyard that you are most excited to, uh, to invest next? Yeah, any of the growth markets. It's anywhere in the Southeast, Texas. Uh, if it's a growth market, I, we're thrilled to be there. And our next fund, that's the biggest change in our next fund. And it's going to be we're going to increase our geographic footprint because we have to. There's just not enough deal flow in Florida. Yep, makes sense. Texas is a big place. The last uh, three deals I bought was in Texas, man. There it is. I love it. I love it over there. Um, all right, moving on. And this one is for your younger self. So if you could go back to the Ken who had no experience in real estate, he was, you know, sitting on the sign lines, watching everybody out there doing their deals, go back to him, look him in the eye, give him one piece of advice moving forward. Yeah. And I, I would form a plan and stick to it and don't deviate. Yep. If, the, if there's one thing that I've probably done over my professional life, I get distracted here and there. I call them little shiny objects that you kind of just, you just find yourself being drawn to and you're like, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Let's go back to where, let's get back on target. Let's get back on plan. So that would be the number one thing because I think we'd be much further ahead. Yeah. No, man, I, you're beautiful, beautiful words there because I, I have the same problem. It is so hard. Um, even in, even if you're only in real estate, like if it's difficult to focus on what you're good at, you know, I'm focused mm -hmm. on self-storage. It's difficult to keep my eyes there and not look at multifamily not look at mobile home mm -hmm. parks, all these different asset classes. Um, so that's great. So keep your eye on the prize. Do not deviate. Yep. All right, next one. And this is an opportunity for you to brag a little bit because everybody on this earth is is here and we have strengths. We all have strengths. There is no question. Um, and you are no different. So if you could point to one thing that you feel you are exceptional at, what would that be? Yeah, it's probably the analytical side. I mean, remember, I said I was, I'm a CPA by background, a commercial lender by background. It, it is proven to be one of my strengths to just really dive into details and understand Having said that's probably also been something that's probably held me back, right? Because it's probably forced me to be con too conservative. Um, but I, you know what? If I were to uh, pick and choose, would I give up the strengths that I have? No. It, 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 I, I'm thrilled to have those strengths. And uh, I feel it's always kept me out of trouble for the most part. Yeah. And they say the, you know, your strengths and your weaknesses, they're just obverse uh, variations of the same thing. So you can't really have a, a strength and without a weakness you, and you got to choose since you have that strength, you just focus on it and, and keep moving forward. You bet. 
which brings us to the very last question. You have given us so much wisdom for real estate investors out there. I'm sure people want to reach out and say, hi, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So the best way is to go to our site, uh, kripartners.com slash ebook. So it's a book. You can get it for free. You just got to give me your email address and get on our list. The title of the book is Multifamily Real Estate's a Total Game Changer. And I wrote the book myself. I focused on two things for the book. The first is the number one question I see everybody facing when they get into real estate. They know there's a ton of money to be made. They're trying to figure out how does it fit for them? And we talked a little bit about that on this call. Should it be a single, a double, self-storage? And I go through that whole process to help you think it through, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had a physician say, you want to stop being a physician and become a real estate investor. I'm like, time out, you know? Uh, <laughs> maybe you need to rethink this. The second part of the book, I make the assumption that most people should passively invest in real estate because, because they just should, right? They, 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 just, they don't really want to change careers. They love what they do. So if you're going to passively invest in real estate, you have to understand how this, this sponsor side of the business works. So for example, if you're looking at investing in our firm, you have to figure out how, to, how do I know KRI is the right place for me? How does this business work? That's what the second part of the book talks about. What's give me some insight into the how the industry works, what makes KRI does what do what KRI does, and, and gives you some ways, some benefits, or some, some ways to vet these sponsors. Because that's the number one thing that is difficult for a private investor to do is to figure out is this the right firm for me or not? Are they good? Is it for real? So on and so forth. So I take the reader through that. So again, it's KRI partners.com slash ebook. It's easy to remember, but I think it's an important read because everybody that's trying to figure this out is probably going to go through those two processes and it's hopeful that I can uh, help them through it. Perfect. All right. So that's kripartners.com slash ebook. I will put that URL in the show notes. So if you guys are interested in grabbing that, sounds like a really good place to start if you're if you're a new investor or if you're looking to invest passively. Um, just click the little description in the in the um, click the little more button in the description. It'll pop down the full description, and in there you can find the the URL and click through and get that ebook. So Ken, it has been a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on here. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, and who for everyone else who is on here with us today, thank you guys for showing up. You are the reason we do this. So if you guys have any question whatsoever, reach out to me, Gabe at therealestateinvestingclub.com. Other than that, I hope you guys have an absolutely fantastic week. Keep rocking real estate. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode as much as I enjoyed putting it on and were able to pull some actionable advice that you can apply in your own investing today in the field. Before you go, we have a gift for you. If you're a new investor looking to get started or an established investor looking to invest, take your investing to the next level, I've created an ebook just for you available on our website. This ebook, ebook will cover how I was able to create both active and passive income in real estate with very little money to start with. In it, I will address the three most often cited obstacles new and veteran investors run into by showing you how to find deals that are actually deals, how to finance a deal with little to no money down and how to exit those deals for maximum value. And if you get the ebook today, I am throwing in a bundle of bonuses, seven of them to be exact. The first one will be the off-market lead generation blueprint, which will take you through the exact systems and processes we use to generate off-market leads like like clockwork, which is the most important skill when it comes to creating wealth in real estate. The second bonus is the A to Z REI systems and vendors guide, which will allow you to peek under the hood of our business and see the exact tools, systems, and even the vendors we use to see the success that we do. And the third bonus is the top 100 best performing keywords pack, which is which will give you the exact keywords we use to target motivated sellers online using PPC ads. The fourth bundle is, or the first fourth bonus is our contracts bundle for wholesaling and renting real estate, which will give you access to all the contracts we use in the field to execute all different types of transactions. After that is the investor's quick analysis calculator and offer tool, which will allow you to quickly calculate whether a deal is an actual deal. 
and will allow you to create an offer automatically with, from those calculations. This is a lot of uh, a lot of bonuses that I said. I'm just going to keep going down the list. Number six is the Investor's Daily Success Tracker, which is a tracker you can use to ensure you are taking the right actions day in and day out to reach your financial goals in real estate. And the last bonus is the Wholesaler's Template for Quick Assignment Cash, which will give you the templates we use to present our wholesale deals professionally and efficiently to our buyers. Whew, that is a bundle. So it's a mouthful. You get all of those bonuses for free when you download the ebook. All we charge is the admin cost to run the show. So if you're interested in the ebook and the bonus bundle, head on over to the website at therealestateinvestingclub.com. Click on get the ebook bundle at the top of the page to take advantage of that deal. And with that said, I hope you have a fantastic day and even better week. Keep rocking real estate. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you.